God's Word. It's Hebrews 9, 27 through 28. <clears throat> Just as a man is detained to, de 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 to die once, and after that he face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So be it. Children's Church. One of my favorite things to do in this world is to go take a little nap with her. So I'll see you. No. <laughs> she fell asleep on me. I'm like, I can't go take a nap with you now, sweetheart. Father, we humbly come before your throne today. We do rejoice and praise that you are God eternal, that you reign supreme, that everything that you have planned out is perfect in every way, and that you would choose to love us. We thank you for the peace that we have to know that you sent your only son to pay for our sins, to do what we could not do for ourselves, and that we have the hope that we've sang about today, that we know that we will spend eternity with you. Lord, help us to focus on the prize, as Paul says, that awaits before us so that we will live a life that we think as of a race, that we need to compete and run for that prize with eagerness, not to worry about the things of this world that may distract us, but to set our sights on the things above, the things that are from you, the things that are pure and righteous, that you pour out your love, that we could call you Father, that you are the sovereign creator and Lord of all things, but you want us to be able to be in a relationship with you. And you did that through the blood of Jesus Christ. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So this week's, this week's activities have been long and hard this week. So it got me to thinking, you know, there's good days, there's bad days. But God reigns supreme through all of them. We just have to see His mercy and His grace shining through. And how we see that in every moment of the day, if you're a Christian, is the fact that He sent His one and only Son to die for you. That's why we're here today, to praise and rejoice that Jesus Christ came that He died for our sins and that He rose again so that He could bring us life, that He could pay the price and set us free. But what does that mean? And we're going to look at that today. So this sermon is entitled, Greatest Day of Your Life. You so many times start looking at the days, you say, boy, today was a hard day. But if you look, you'll see the little nuggets of truth that God put all in your path that day to carry you through it. When you think you don't have the strength, you don't have the understanding or the, or the power to do the things that are ahead of you, that you can't face this day, God will pull you through it. He's there with you every step of the way. Jesus said, I won't leave you as an orphan. I will send back the Spirit from the Father so that He will be with you. He will comfort, He will guide, He will protect. There's so many things that the Spirit does if you simply will allow Him to have the power and control in your life. So when you look at the days of your life, you'll find the greatness of God in them. But what are the greatest days of our life? Well, what does greatest mean? What does it mean to you? It's a superlative of great. That's the definition if you look at a dictionary. What a definition. That doesn't tell me anything. It's of the highest quality or degree is what great is. Okay, I understand that. But greatest then has to be better than that. It has to be the best of the best, the supreme. So what does that mean? It means large in number or size. What am I doing wrong? Thank you. I couldn't have my bow tie and suspenders on straight if it wasn't for the ladies, all the ladies in my life. Thank you. It means large in number or size. That's not what we're talking about, is it? The greatest number in an equation? No, we're not talking about that at all. Of extreme or more than usual significance or importance or consequence. Well, that's getting a little more like it. So greatest would be the most extreme the most unusual, the most significant, important consequence. The Bible uses it several times in scriptures. John 7, 37 says, and on the last and greatest day of the festival. So if you can comprehend that, you know that Jesus had come to Jerusalem and the festival was at its pinnacle, it was at its height when he came and said, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, not what you would expect, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. 
We'll leave that topic for another day, but he floored everyone that was around him. What does that mean? It means my time is come. All those who will believe in me and drink of the spiritual water that I offer will have eternal life. It's also used in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. It says, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And that's because love remains. Faith brings about the hope that we have as Christians and believers and brings about love where we can love our neighbor, that we can love our enemies, as Jesus said. What other way can we do that besides a divine love? Can we love our enemies? There's no way that I could love my family, let alone my friends, let alone those who persecute me, if it weren't for the supernatural power given by the Spirit of God in my life. To realize why God, not why as in fathoming it, but that He did, it's a reality whether I understand it or not, loved me so much that He sent His only Son to redeem me back, to purchase me back and adopt Him as a child. So why in the world would I not want to share that love and freely give it as it was freely given to me? So we've defined the word greatest. So what is the greatest days of your life? When you think about it, how about the day you were born? That was a great day. It was a great day for you. You exist. It was a great day for your parents, friends, relatives. They looked anxiously for that day when the birth of that child would come. In expectation, hoping that everything was okay, that everything was going to be fine. And when that day came, they rejoiced. What a great day. Genesis 128 says, God bless them. Don't forget that in every day. Whether that day is everything that you expected it to be, or there were some complications and sadness. God bless them. That's the reason you have the ability to reproduce. That's the reason that you are sitting here breathing today. Is God chose to create you and bless you. God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God is in control. God has a story. It's called history, His story. And He has a plan for every one of you. And that plan starts with redeeming you back into sonship or into his and being His daughter. Psalm 139, 13 says, For He created my inmost being. He knit me together in my mother's womb. He was there every step of the way. He formed you. He designed you. You were not an accident. You were a plan. You were part of God's plan. Designed and created for His intent and purpose to worship Him and bring Him the glory and honor that He deserves. Genesis 1.27, we'll back up one verse from what we read before. It says, So God created mankind in His own image. In the image of God, He created them, male and female, He created them. So that applies to men and women. They're equal in every aspect. They're all God's children, all designed and valued by God, valued so much that He would shed His own Son's blood to, to forgive you and to redeem you back. Jeremiah 1.5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. More proof that God was there every single step of the way. Before you ever breathed that first breath, He was there designing and forming you. You're perfect in every way in His eyes. The only thing is we've got to get rid of that sin, which we can't do, but Jesus Christ can. All we've got to do is freely accept that gift. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper. And that doesn't mean to be successful in this world. It means to be successful spiritually. To prosper you, to not harm you. God is not someone who sits up on His throne and says, You'll do this or you'll do that. And I don't want you to be happy or fun. He wants you to experience the most joy that you can ever imagine. But you've got to realize that He is a Father to you. We, we try to complicate it. It says, not to harm you, but plans to give you a hope and a future. When you sit and think about it, Jesus says, let the little children come unto me. We as God's children, those who have received Jesus Christ as their Savior, can call Him Abba or Father. My dad's here today. He gets to see me preach. It's been a long, complicated week, but here's a nugget. I don't know if he would have been here except for the wedding of my son, which is a great and wonderful event. But there was a lot of stress coming up to it, wasn't there? My son Nathan is here. And I can call him my son because he lived with me. And I helped raise him. 
I read him Bible stories that he had no idea what those stories were. But we cherished that time and we talked about God. We talked about the love of God. Because that's what my purpose is, is to tell him and teach him. But we had a lot of sorrow and a lot of trouble in it. We've had a lot of people muddy the waters even more because they're worried about themselves rather than the things that are going on. But we'll make it through it because we have a peace. We have love that can only come from above. It's so obvious where it comes from. And we can call God the creator of all the universe that holds the stars in his hands, that holds the power of life and death in his hands. He says, I love you enough that I want you to be my child. We don't need to muddy up the waters. It's that simple. When I was young, when Jacob was young, we looked to our fathers. He was like a God figure. He was the person who protected me, loved and nurtured me and cared for me. I didn't worry when I was in his arms as a little child. But as I grow bigger and independent, I gave him a hard time. I disobeyed. I rebelled. I didn't see what I saw at first. I complicated and muddied the waters. But the truth is, is that was the man who loved me and cared for me. He would never want any harm for me. He wanted the best for me. Plans for me to prosper, to have a prosper, prosperous future. And if my dad does that, how much does our Heavenly Father do that for us? If I do that for Jacob, if he does that for Kira, we're sinners saved by grace. How much more does God want for you? God chose to create you. He designed you. Don't f cut that short at all. What about the day you turned 16 because we started getting independent? That was a great day of our life, wasn't it? Because we wanted a car where we could go out and do what we wanted to do. We could get further away from our parents. We could go out and do things that we couldn't have done otherwise. And this car will take us wherever. This country's built on four wheels because we can take to the open highway. But really, was it as great a day as we thought it would be that day? We still lived at home. We still had guidelines. We still had to afford gas and insurance. So we longed for that day and we thought, hmm, maybe it wasn't the greatest day after all. So then we said, what about when we turn 18? I'll be free then. I won't have to worry about what my parents say anymore. I can choose whatever career I want or anything. I might even move out. Wait a minute, there's bills. <laughs> there's trouble in life. Hmm, maybe this isn't exactly what I thought it would be. So we keep longing, we keep changing. That freedom that we thought was not what it truly was. But we were free. We were free to choose an adult, but still came troubles and trials. There were good days, there were bad days. So what about this freedom? Well, biblically it's defined in Galatians 5.1. It is for freedom or liberty, as the King James Version says, that Christ has set us free. We are supposed to free, be free. Stand firm then that you do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. So when I was 18 and free, it kind of dawned on me, maybe for the first time in my life, that my dad did want the best for me. That I was free, and that free meant that I respected and loved him and understood some of the things that I didn't understand before. And the same thing can apply spiritually. That we shouldn't fall back again into the yoke of slavery. Because scriptures tell us that we're bound to one master or another and we can only serve one master. And Christ has set us free so that we're not in bondage. So that we don't serve the master of this world, the prince of darkness, but that we can truly serve God through Jesus Christ and the power of the Spirit. In verse 13 it says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather serve one another humbly in love. Well, at 18, we're considered an adult in this country anyway. That varies whether they, where you're considered. If you read in books and magazines, females are mature faster than males. Males are supposed to mature by the time they're 25. I've seen plenty of 40-year-old males that haven't matured. It's a growth process, though. That's exactly what it is. It's a process that we grow. And so is our walk spiritually. That's why Paul says many times in his letters that you're still like infants. You're not feeding. And Jesus was clear. We started that out this morning. To feed on the living water. In John 6, he said, I am the bread of life. If you feed off of him, he will fill you. He will nourish you. He will give you everything you need for this world and to prepare you for the kingdom of heaven, which is at hand. 
The opposite of freedom is slavery. So if you're not free, then you're probably in bondage still. You're probably a part of slavery, whether you realize it or not. And Scripture is clear. It says you can't serve two masters. You will serve one or the other. So if it's for freedom and liberty that you're set free, then we've got to make sure we live that way. But I can't do it on my own. So I have to die to myself daily, as Jesus says. Take up my cross and follow Him. I have to live a life according to the Spirit. Daily, not once in a while, I need to spend my life in prayer and spend my life in reading God's Word and studying His Scriptures. Because as soon as I back out just a little bit, Satan will be right there attacking this week, won't he? He'll come in full force when the days that should be the greatest days in our lives, truly, he'll attack and try to muddy up the waters and destroy and take the glory away from God because that's what he does. He doesn't want you to give glory and honor to God where all good things come from. The institution of marriage was designed by God. The ability to reproduce and have children and the blessings of the children are from God. Romans 6, 16 through 18 says, Don't you know that when you offer yourself to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Whether you are slave to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slave to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and be, have become slaves of righteousness. That's God's plan. His plan is that all men come to Him and that all men know who He is. And when you realize that you have a Father in heaven, not just a Creator, not even just a Lord, but a Father who cares about you passionately, more than you could ever imagine in this world, whether you had a good Father figure or a bad Father figure. He loves you that much it kind of changes your perspective on things. How can you not rejoice? We're here today to rejoice that Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose again because God so loved the world. How about the day you got married? That was a great day. How about you, Jacob? Did it turn out to be a great day? Was it the greatest day? Well, he'll learn in a few days, <laughs> maybe quicker than that, that it's tough. He already knows it going in. Huh? I said she's still asleep. <laughs> it's two people that say, hey, if we get married, things will be better. <laughs> but two people that have to, and they did this unity sand, which was very beautiful, which put a foundation layer first if you weren't there. They chose purple to put down first as royalty, that they were submitting to the royalty of God the Father in their marriage. And then they poured in separate sands representing their lives. Then they mixed the sands together, showing that once they're mixed together, you can't really separate them anymore. And that foundation was God. They know the biblical foundation. Now, does that make it easy? Does that mean every day is going to be that way? Does it, honey? No. But if we have a foundation, then we have something solid to build upon. We're not building our lives and our marriage on sinking sands. It's a great day but probably not the greatest day. And Genesis 2.18 says, The Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So the only reason that we have marriage in the first place is God ordained it for our best interests because He wanted us to learn about relationships so that we could learn and understand how much He loves and desires a relationship with us. So what about the day your first child was born and then subsequent children? What wonderful days. We've gone to your birth to the fact that you're being able to be a part of birth. You don't understand why or how, but you're so thankful that you were able to procreate and make a child. You don't have to understand the physics of it, do you? You don't have to understand how it happens. You don't have to understand why God loves you. You could sit and try to figure that out the rest of your life, and you probably won't, but He does. You can fig try to figure out how in the world could there only be one way, one truth, and one life. But Jesus says it. And He did die. You can look at history and see. You can see the prophecies that He fulfilled. And He loved you and He set the captives free that day on Calvary. Death has no sting. We can just long for the day when all things will be made right because that's what God's Word says will happen. 
if we choose to believe. We don't have to understand how. We don't have to understand why. We just have to choose to believe. And Jesus said, unless a man be born again, if he believes and be born again, that that old life dies and the new life starts, which is not by our own power or might. When you were born physically, you had no control over what happened. You had to learn and grow. You had to learn to crawl. You couldn't feed yourself. And the same thing is true spiritually. You have to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit to develop you, to mature you, so that you can be like Christ. But that probably was not the greatest day of your life. Psalms 127 says, Behold, children are a gift from the Lord, so don't forget that again. You wouldn't have them in the first place if it wasn't for God. You see a pattern here of a loving father? The fruit of the womb is a reward. John 16, 21 says, Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. It's painful. It's hard. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born in the world. I don't know if you've heard me say it or not. Some of you have. But I had the stupidity in my life of after how many hours of labor? 36 hours of labor say, I don't understand what's wrong with you. All women have to go through this. Now, that, yeah, bravo. That, at the time, I thought, hey, honey, you need to suck it up. But that was one of the stupidest things that I've ever said. And I am reminded of it over and over again. But when he was born, didn't matter if she'd been in labor 200 hours. Her precious child that she had longed for for so long that she didn't do anything. We tried all kind of fertility methods, everything else. Finally gave up and said, okay, God. And he said, okay. It's not by your power, your might, your doctor's might. It's by my might that I'll bless you with a child. And he did. And sometimes since then I thought, huh. But then I realized that blessings are from the Lord. And I'm so thankful for what I have in this life. All good things come from Him. So what about the day you die? We've had to face that this week. It all depends. It can be the greatest day of someone's life. Or it can be the worst day. We faced John's passing this week. And we talked to him a lot beforehand. And he said he was at peace with Jesus. So we're going to celebrate with a memorial service on Tuesday. We're going to celebrate in the hope that we have that we'll be together again with God our Father in heaven for all of eternity. That makes the greatest day. And that ties directly into your day of salvation. I'm not trying to say one's greater than the other. But without either one, there's nothing but sadness and death. If you want this life to be great, whatever days are great, then first of all, you need to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You can't have it without it. And then you need to grow. You need to realize how much your Father does love you and that He's equipped you with everything that you need to make it through this world. That it doesn't matter about the things going on around where the people are being shot or run over with trucks or anything else. What matters is that we tell them about Jesus because we have that hope. So that when that day comes, however it comes, that they'll get to spend eternity in heaven rather than eternity apart from God their Father. That's what matters. Don't let Satan muddy up the waters and tell you this or that is important. What's important is that Mark wants to worship God. And he sees a family that he wants to worship with because he has that peace. We read Hebrews 9.27 and 28 this morning, 927 says, Just as people are destined to die once, and after that face judgment. I don't like that scripture by itself, do you? It's sobering, it's scary, but without, without the next verse, there's no hope. But in verse 28 it says, So, because of this, as a result of God's love, Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And He will appear a second time. Not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting on Him. Wow. Now that makes it all clear. Makes the hope outstanding. Makes me want to rejoice. Because I know that I've sinned in my life. 
but I've been set free because I chose to believe in Jesus Christ. Not by any works of righteousness which I have done, but according to His mercy, I can be saved. Everyone who experiences life will experience death. This is a joke, just so you know first. So I asked a few guys the other day how they wanted to be remembered when they died. The first one answered as a great humanitarian so the world could see that he was an asset to his community. Okay. The next one answered, I want to be a great husband and father, an example for those to follow. That sounds even better. The next guy I asked, he said, I just want people to think I moved. Because that's what we're doing. He's, You're gone from this world, but you just went to the next. You've moved. That's simple. Death is not an end. It's a change. Everything we looked at in those days was a change. No matter whether they were a good change, bad change, hard change, easy change, they involved change. The day you were born, things changed. The day you turned 16, things changed. They changed more at 18. They definitely changed when you got married. And they definitely changed when you had a child. But they will change for all eternity on the day that you breathe your last. So number one, you've got to be right with God. And then you need to tell everyone that you possibly can so that they can be made right with God. There was an elderly lady riding on a bus and a cynical man noticed her sitting there reading her Bible. He said, you don't believe in that nonsense, do you? She said, yes, I believe in every word of it. He says, you mean to tell me you believe in stories like Jonah and the well? That was one of our first stories, wasn't it? And we sang the veggie shell story in the belly of a whale. One of Nathan and Jacob's favorite songs. We'll do it sometime. And she says, yes, I believe it. I believe it with all of my life, with all of my heart. He said, I just don't understand your foolishness. So what if Jonah's not there that day when you get to heaven? She said, well, then you'll have to ask him. Because we're going to be one place or the other. It is a life or death matter. And the peace that surpasses all understanding can only come from Jesus Christ. And I wasn't implying Jonah wouldn't be in heaven. Don't go saying that. Okay? <laughs> Hebrews 9, 27, 28 says, Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting on him. There are great days of your life. Even greater days. Much greater days. Once you have the peace that surpasses all understanding. So what makes a difference on that day? And every day? Jesus. We need to tell everyone about Him. John eleven twenty five 25 and 26 says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? He was talking to Martha, who was mourning over the death of her brother Lazarus. She thought all hope was gone. My brother is dead. If only you would have been here, Jesus, you could have saved him. I'm at a loss now. My brother's gone. But he wasn't. She didn't understand that. Jesus would raise Lazarus from the dead. And He has the power to raise everyone from eternal death and bring them to eternal life. John eleven twenty five 25 and 26 says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in Me will, will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in Me will never die. Do you believe this? Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the hope that's there. We thank You that You have told the story of how much You love us. Because we get distracted in this world. Satan tries to tear us from the truth. And he says, Does, did God really say that? Does He really love you? Or, can we really be sure? Without a doubt. And we thank You for that. We thank You that You would choose to love us. We don't understand it. Why You would choose to love a sinner such as I but you do, and we thank you and praise you for that today. 
Oh, Father, we thank you for your love that you would send mercy and grace through Jesus Christ rather than the judgment and the wages for our sins that we deserve. We thank you and praise you. May you empower this body by the Spirit. If there's anyone here that doesn't know that peace, Lord, bring them to you today. Call them and draw them forth. And Lord, help us to teach the gospel message, to tell others the hope that we have, to live a life that brings worth and glory and praise and honor to you. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.